in Australia. Um, we thought it was a, a, a good time to, to look at these problems. Uh, one is looking at um, um, membrane cleaning. You know, as you know, there are so many different ways that you can clean a, a reverse osmosis membrane. So um, um, Marlene Cran has put together a project and will tell us about um, the met methods that are available today for operators to, to clean their membranes and uh, this will be published so I hope it will be widely disseminated and used. In fact, the early uh, questions we've had about it uh, indicate that it will be well received. So with that, I would like to introduce uh, Marlene Cran from Victoria University. Thank you, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to present the results of uh, the, the project that I've been working on, the cleaning of uh, guidelines for desalination membranes. We've been doing this work in conjunction with a couple of industry partners. I'm very fortunate um, to have, have them on, on board. Uh, integrated Elements with our Eddie Ostasevich and also uh, Nelco from um, and Andrew Head was uh, assisting us with this one. So the, um, the issue with, with membranes is that everyone knows that they can become contaminated uh, over a period of time and also they can also uh, get fouled if, if they haven't been used for some time and incorrectly stored. So there are a lot of uh, things that people can do to prevent or to uh, uh, delay fouling such as anti-scalance, biosizing. But even these, after a period of time, fouling is generally inev inevitable, but it can be reversible in most cases. So regular membrane cleaning is therefore very vital to have effective uh, desalination and membrane processes. Uh, typically, there are a number of different foulants that can um, affect membranes, and these include uh, these various types of materials, organics, metal oxides, and biofouling and silica are, are some of the most uh, common ones for desalination membranes, and uh, silica is, is something that's important Look, to, to the work at Victoria University, we'll hear more about that uh, later this morning. So if uh, the problems of fouling are not addressed by regular cleaning, there are some effects that can occur. So the performance of the system will decline over a period of time, or rapidly in some cases, and often system recovery can be limited if it's not uh, addressed uh, quickly. And you may have some serious damage to the membranes, and there's also the potential for irreversible fouling, which uh, is potentially not able to be cleaned, and therefore you need to replace your membrane. And that, yeah, that, that's what can shorten the membrane service life. It can be quite expensive. So when I was looking at this project, there was a vast a range of sources of cleaning information available. And most of them are uh, available online or through subscriptions. So there's manufacturer directions, and these are often supplied with, uh, with the membranes when you purchase them. And they have web support. They'll have, have documents with a lot of different um, instructions for cleaning and uh, recommendations for, for different chemicals. There's also a, a, a quite a large number of commercial cleaning products that are uh, available on the market and they often come with supplier instructions with different concentrations and temperatures that you need to, to follow to have effective cleaning. And then there's the, the literature on cleaning which is very, very wide and broad. There's a lot of patents and technical documents that are available. I think in the whole project I collected maybe five or, five or six hundred different, different sources of information that I've been through. And then there's also the uh, undocumented or user-specific um, information, which is, comes from plants, operators. They'll, they'll often, if they've got a particular problem that they don't know how to solve, they'll, they might, may try different, different remedies. And that, off, that information is often hidden. Um, so we tried to tap into some of that as well. So the aim was to have a look at all of this information and see what we could do in, 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 in terms of compiling it into a, a reasonable um, document or, or some other format that people could uh, access it and 
um, have some kind of effective, like a, a bit of a um, somewhere to go to if they want to know how to clean their membranes, particularly if they have issues that they don't know how to solve. So the outcomes of this project are um, a literature review, which is being finalised at the moment. Um, it looks at about 150 different patents and there's also maybe two or three hundred um, journal articles that I've looked through. Um, and uh, not so much the, um, uh, the technical documents, but that's in, in, I've captured that in the database itself. So the second outcome, which I'll be presenting today, is the cleaning guidelines. Um, we just tried to decide how we would present this because there's so much information and we wanted to have a way that people could access it quite easily. So typically, most of this information will be provided in a, in a document, uh, PDF files, um, so you just have to go through and read them. But we thought it might be more interesting and more user friendly if we could create some kind of a, a interactive database that people could use and do search and find information quickly and even pre present recipes and things like that for cleaning. So, so um, this is what I'll present today. And initially I presented it, I prepared it in an uh, Excel document. Um, and it got very, very big and it wasn't really very interactive. Um, at the same time I was, pre I was preparing this pr uh, information, I started to collect a lot of, a lot of data on uh, commercial cleaners and I prepared that in an access database just for my own personal um, records. So it seemed to be that that was probably the best way to go. So I decided that uh, in discussions with, um, with David and, and the other guys here, decided that might be the best way. So I'll present that shortly. Um, so the key for effective cleaning is knowing when to clean your membrane. And there are several key uh, performance indicators that are often very um, indicative of, 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 a of troubleshooting, prob uh, knowing when to trou troubleshoot and knowing when to clean. Um, these are quite accepted in the literature and, and uh, uh, apart from the uh, magnitude of that, which is a little bit different for different places. It's usually um, a, looking at a reduction in uh, normalised flux by about 10 to 15 percent, or if there's an increase in salt passage by 5 to 10 percent, or an increase in the um, pressure drop uh, by 10 to 15 percent. So these three key performance indicators are critical when it uh, comes to timely and effective cleaning. So if you if something if your problem exceeds this and you're getting a, um, an increase in normalised flux by 50%, it may not be able to be recovered. So when I was looking at all of the information, I tried to compile the, 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 um, the different troubleshooting, uh, troubleshooting um, key indicators as a, as a bit of a matrix. Um, so this gives you an indication of where you might have a problem, what the problem is in each of those three key performance indicators, and also critically is the, the possible cause. So the, um, and you can see that most of these have um, fairly unique combinations, um, and th this is taken from uh, quite a lot of the literature. There, there are a number of these that are, are out there and they're usually fairly consistent, but there are some cases where they're slightly different. One might say there's a no increase in, in something or there's a, only a slight increase. But so I've tried to take um, a, a general average of what this troubleshooting matrix should be and what the, the possible causes are. So biofouling is, is one of the critical ones. So you usually get a large increase in the feed pressure and the pressure drop and often there's no change in the salt passage or there might be a, a slight improvement because you get uh, better uh, rejection. And that can usually affect any of the elements but usually on the lead elements. Um, these ones that I've just highlighted here, uh, these are quite indicative of where you've had some kind of a, a failure in the membrane and usually that would uh, need replacement. Usually occurs in the first stages when you've had a, uh, an event where you may have chlorine has attacked the membrane and you'll need to be replaced. Um, so you can see that this is separated into two parts. 
So from um, from the, from here and up, these are usually things that can be solved by cleaning. Uh, but down here, these this particular set of, uh, of key performance indicators usually mean that you've had some kind of failure and need to replace the membranes or, or do some more troubleshooting to see if you have leaking O-rings and so on. Um, so in terms of what's available for cleaning, there are a lot of different agents available, uh, hundreds and hundreds of them that I've seen in the literature and uh, on, on, uh, through, available commercially. So you have the generic products, so the acids, surfactants, alkalis and those sorts of products. And um, uh, most manufacturers recommend a, a series of, of cleaning regimes for these and different concentrations and temperatures. You also have uh, commercial products and there are a very uh, wide range of those in Australia. Um, and they have different formulations with different compositions and they'll, they'll uh, address different types of fouling, sometimes more difficult fouling to clean. Uh, some of the key literature findings that I've uh, just wanted to present today, uh, two that, that really stand out is one is um, looking at changing the pH of the cleaning. So typically a, tip, a, a cleaning regime for biofouling of, of thin film composite polyamide uh, membranes would be a pH of uh, an alkaline then acid clean, so starting a pH of about, about uh, 11. But um, this group of researchers found that they do an acid clean and an alkaline clean of 12, uh, about 12 to 13 and they found that was highly effective and uh, so that's something that w might be interesting if people have big problems with biofouling. The second one is um, one that's come up recently as well. Uh, some, a group in the Netherlands have looked at using uh, CO2 as a uh, in dissolved CO2 in um, a cleaning solution. So they inject it under pressure and the bubbles that form under the low pressure clean the spaces and uh, they claim 100% recovery very quickly. Um, and this, I think, just last year in December, um, I think they have started using this widely in some of their plants, and so it may become a commercial product. Um, as I mentioned before, I tried to think of a way to put this, all this information together to make it in sort of an interactive, um, uh, in, in, sort of like trying to develop a bit of a web page something similar to a web page that people could look at different chapters or look at different sections and, and get the information that they need or, or at least get some information that they could uh, refer to. Um, so before I present that, I'll just briefly go through what the conclusions are of the product, so of the, of the pro of, of project. So there were, obviously there's a very wide range of cleaning information available in the literature, in the uh, industri in, through industry and uh, we wanted to try to capture that information in a useful format um, and, and make it available for, for everyone to use. Um, based on that, we think there's a potential to develop some kind of a web-based uh, uh, application and in fact in the last few days I've just released um, Office 2013 and because I've developed this in Access. Um, the new version of Access actually enables you to um, develop web applications directly from Access. That's something I could discuss with, uh, with you later. Um, so basically what we've done with this is we've just strictly tried to confine the, the project to cleaning. But there's probably a big potential to extend it to other chemicals. Because if you look at the um, anti-scalants and biocides, for example, there's a lot of those on the market and it would be interesting to try to capture those as well. Maybe as an extension to the database or as a separate database. Um, there's quite a, quite a broad um, uh, a scope for that. And of course I would like to finally acknowledge uh, NCED for their support of this project. So um, based on that, I would like to now give you a bit of a demonstration of the database. Um, so when you start it up, sorry, I'll just go to be on my home page. Um, I've, get, I've prepared a bit of a, a bit of a home page. I've tried to make it look clean and, and useful, so it looks a bit like a web page, and you can just click on different um, 
different tabs and, and get to the different uh, sections that you want to look at. So um, to start with, we've got um, a bit of a, a description of each of the sections. And if you look at, um, for example, membrane fouling, I've got another uh, series of tabs looking at the different types of fouling. And I've given a definition of each of those and what sort of effect it will have on performance. And also, importantly, I've looked at a typical range of, of cleaning um, recipes that you might, might use uh, to clean these types of things. A very basic CIP process and some comments to say how effective it might be or if you need to uh, address a different temperature and so on. So for each of those, I've got um, I've looked at biofouling, organic fouling, uh, colloids, metal oxides, carbonates, sulfates and silica. These seem to be the most typical types of foulants for desalination membranes and each of those will have different sets of cleaning regimes, different chemicals, um, extremes of different extremes of pH and, and they'll have different um, outcomes as well. So some of them are effective, uh, quite effective to, to clean um, uh, things like the sulfate scales, but it may be less effective to try to clean carbonate scales. Um, in fact, if you if you leave these for too long, they can um, uh, build up on the membrane. It's very difficult to clean. Uh, the other important one is silica. So what I've done, I've just got a bit of a um, so I've just imported some dummy some um, some sample data in here. So um, these aren't actually for strictly cleaning silica. I've just uh, chosen the main use. So uh, for silica, that's that's one of the most difficult ones to clean, uh, as you you'll hear a bit uh, a bit later, difficult to to address. So particularly polymerized silica, so you often need to replace your membrane if you have that issue. Um, so what I'll have in the this is a, this is the second version based on the the original um, access, uh, sorry the original Excel database. So I've tried to convert everything into access and. Um, so it's it's a little bit more user friendly. You can do search a more um, uh, effective searching, and you can actually add different fields. So I'll show you a little bit later on what I mean by that. Um, so the the next one is fouling identification. So this is an updated version of that uh, slide I showed you earlier. We're looking at the fouling matrix. Um, so basically, this is. A, a merging of all the information that I could find on what could affect your membrane, what observed property change you would have, the causes and the suggested remedies. So um, this is just a very general saying you can try to clean it. Then if you click on these buttons down the side, that will take you back to that, that original page on membrane fouling and you should be able to um, address, to see what, what you might be able to use to clean that and what's other, uh, you can have more information on the definition and uh, typical cleaners. Um, uh, the other button here is for additional information. So I've tried to, where, I, where possible, where things are, I've found free documents, I've tried to include references to those so people can click on those and get much more information that I've been able to uh, provide in here. And often they're very useful sources of, of different types of fouling and, and those types of indicators. So um, the other approach to to um, to looking at this was a fouling tool. So rather than uh, looking through these, I, th I thought it might be useful if you could do a bit of a, a calculation, do a bit of a selection to see where you might have a problem. And you can click on what... Um, what issue you might be having. So there might be a pressure drop, so an intermediate decrease uh, across the board. And then if you click Analyze Problem, it, I've got a bit of a, a matrix in the, back, in the background of this. So it, it works similar to this failing identification table and it will look up what is, is there. So it's just another way to, to um, try to identify what type of failing you might have. And then you can um, go back and see what kind of cleaners you would have. So the key to all of the, this, the, the table 
and all of the, the information in the fouling tool is what, is what do they mean when they say uh, a decrease or rapid increase. So what does that mean in terms of, um, of the perceived effect? So the key to that is uh, the fouling speed. So um, I've put up a, a description of what is meant by fouling speed. Um, so if you have an observed property change that's slow, that can happen over a long period of time, and it's often the most common, uh, common but very difficult to, to determine what it is. So if you have an intermediate or a rapid change in one of those particular properties, they're quite usually a little bit more easy to identify what they are. So if you have a rapid change within about 24 hours, you've probably got some organics or clay or silt failing your membrane. So it was, uh, it was quite interesting to find out that a lot of the information that I, uh, that I looked at, they have different terms to describe these. So I just tried to, to get what was um, like a consensus through these. Um, so when it's with the property change, this is usually referring to the speed and the extent uh, of the, the change. Um, so the key to the fouling tool and um, what the, the, the extent of the change is normalization. So that's really critical. Um, so cleaning, as I showed before in the, in the slides, uh, cleaning is recommended when you have a change in any of these properties over a period of time and you get, like it's, it's generally in the range of 5 to maybe up to 20% change. Um, so how do you measure that? Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of information on how to normalise your data so that you know what you can keep track of when you've had a drop in, in performance so that you can attribute it back to a particular fouling issue. Uh, and there's a, there is a lot of information in the literature about that. So what I, if, in the original uh, Excel uh, database that I created, I did set up uh, a bit of a calculator to, to calculate this, um, to calculate these formulas. So these formulas have come out of, of the literature. So you've got a formula to calculate uh, the permeate flow under standard conditions, uh, salt passage, uh, temperature correction, and there's a few other calculators for concentrations and pressures. And these generally come from uh, an ASTM method, which is a standard practice for standardizing reverse osmosis performance data. But when I was also going through that, I found that there was a lot of um, free software that was available, and I've put some links into those. And these are either free or they're available free with registration, and they offer a method for people to use these, and, and other plants may have already developed their own software that's integrated with their systems that they can keep track of this and, um, and, and, and then assess what the, what the changes are. So these are just some of the examples, and they're basically uh, they're generally available in, in Excel spreadsheets and they're all free. So I'll put the links in here. This one here from uh, CSM is a standalone uh, file which you just have to do an installation. The others are all quite uh, useful and free. And I have copies of those as well. So I thought I would just introduce the, the different formulas and, uh, um, and just a bit of the information that's available there. So um, when I was developing this I thought it would be useful if I could set up um, the database in a way that I could capture the information on the cleaning agents. And I've done that here. Um, so this just gives a basic overview of some of the data. I, don't, I haven't imported it all in just yet because I wasn't sure if it would, um, uh, if, if I could show it all today. But um, basically what I've done here is uh, some of this is in the background, so this is quite a, a read-only database. I should have mentioned that before. Um, so it's there's not a lot that you can um, add your own data. So we think that it might be something that people, if, if you have any information that you think should be added, then you can maybe contact us and we can see if we can uh, get things added in. Um, so the, the the critical part about the commercial cleaning agents is that. Um, we want to know what they what they're for, what cleaning, uh, what their main use is. Um, might be useful to have a link to 
the, the MSDS or at least the product data sheet so you can see what, uh, what they're in. But the other the critical thing that we thought would be useful would be the composition. In some cases it's not available, um, they're proprietary formulations, but uh, in other cases when they've got some hazardous products, they usually list some of the main chemicals. Um, and then we can have links to those and you can see what, uh, you can create your own like, risk assessments and that sort of thing. Um, so that's the, the commercial agents and then you have some more on the general chemicals and so you have things like the citric acid, the hydrochloric acid, the hydroxide, the alkalis and uh, some surfactants and things. And uh, this is where it's a little bit more useful where I can capture more information like um, the formulas, CAS numbers, packaging groups and uh, risk and phrases and also what the main use is for cleaning and also a link to the MSDS. Um, so we, we weren't sure how we would host these links, so that's something that we're still trying to figure out. Um, so you have we have the cleaning agents, the general chemicals, and the other key is the suppliers. So well, people might want to know information on where they can get these chemicals if they find one that's more useful for them. Um, so uh, there are some uh, some information on the on various suppliers and. Um, some tabs down here that will have lists of what chemicals that they can provide and also what cleaning agents they can provide. So if you had to go through directly and that, this, this on its own might be quite useful um, when it's populated to, to get information from about the various suppliers. And it might also be useful to have um, in the home page some kind of a, um, uh, a, a way to um, filter everything. So say if you have a preferred supplier, you might just only want to select them. So it might be a way to that uh, to filter out all the information that you don't want. Or if you just buy chemicals from a, from a certain state, you might want to filter out all the other states. Um, the other thing I thought would be very useful, we'd have links to other cleaning guides. So all these um, are quite freely available and uh, it's something that um, that I've used a lot. This is just only a selected, uh, some of the selected ones. Um, so basically what I've tried to do is capture anything I could about cleaning, put it in here and if there's anything that I've missed or if there's any feedback, um, I'll have a, have a feedback page and we'll be able to um, provide uh, assistance with using the database or if you have any comments or any <laughs> suggestions, um, that would also be something that we could do. So whether it's myself or it's um, someone from NCED uh, when this, this project's finalised, so um, we can see who, who would be the person that could go to because I think it's important to have a bit of support when you're, when you're using one of these tools. Um, so basically it's just, it's a, I've tried to compile the information that I could to um, help people with membrane cleaning and um, I think uh, that's probably it. So I think it's time for questions. Any questions? Marketing tools more than uh, technical merit, how yeah. did you deal with that uh, when you publish it for, uh, for users? Uh, the question was about uh, verification of the the information that I've compiled. Um, basically, I haven't put in any claims that things are one thing will work better than another uh, another chemical. Um, I think it's more of a it's really just a, a guide, an overview guide to to what is useful, and I think that people need to assess that if it's really right for them. Um, yeah, that's a it's a very good question, and um, I've tried to to just um, get as much information as I could on the different things and whether or not they work. Uh, there are some literature. Well, there is a lot of literature information that we can look at um, uh, also to to see if these if these different chemicals will work, um, and wherever that's possible, I'll, I'll, I have included that.
it, it's as most of us in the business have known or throughout uh, the history of membrane plants um, those who manufacture chemicals for cleaning are not always uh, straight forward and or forthcoming with the contents of their chemicals because it's um, proprietary yes. and they want to keep it that way exactly so yes. unfor it's unfortunate but uh, that's the way they make their money in the business so um, we have to live with that but I think Marlene's done a great job of putting together all the things all the tools I should say that are commercially available to everyone and a, and a way to determine which of those is most likely to be of help. Are there any other questions? Yes. Uh, no. I uh, repeat that. Uh, looking at um, uh, the product selection for based on the, the standards, um, I think what the primary aim is to um, uh, to assist people to use the membranes, but um, I think the key would be to for them to follow the mem membrane manufacturer's guidelines in the very first instance, and um, and they often provide very good information on cleaning. Like Dow Chemical, for example, they have very very good um, list of cleaning agents for their for their membranes, and they have uh, they use just the generic agents. Other uh, manufacturers like Coke, they have a big range of Coke clean chemicals, but they don't sell them in Australia. So they just recommend, um, their recommendation for cleaning would be to, to go to Nelco. Um, so it's really, I think it, primarily it's, um, it's up to the, the users to do what's best for their membranes, particularly one, while they're under the warranty period and they have to follow the manufacturer's guidelines. But I think it's important when they, uh, if they've got a really severe problem that they think may be able to be cleaned, um, that they could perhaps try uh, some of the techniques that we've we've put here. Um, the other thing is that the, the, the chemicals that we've selected in here are, are very strongly um, based on the, the, the membrane manufacturers as well. Wendell? Uh, no. I'll uh, repeat that. Uh, looking at um, uh, the product selection for based on the, the standards, um, I think what the primary aim is to um, uh, to assist people to use the membranes, but um, I think the key would be to for them to follow the mem membrane manufacturer's guidelines in the very first instance, and um, and they often provide very good information on cleaning. Like Dow Chemical, for example, they have very very good um, list of cleaning agents for their for their membranes, and they have uh, they use just the generic agents. Other uh, manufacturers like Coke, they have a big range of Coke clean chemicals, but they don't sell them in Australia. So they just recommend um, their recommendation for cleaning would be to to go to Nelco. Um, so it's really, I think, it, primarily it's um, it's up to the the users to do what's best for their membranes, particularly one while they're under the warranty period, and they have to follow the manufacturer's guidelines. But I think it's important when they uh, if they've got a really severe problem that they think may be able to be cleaned. Um, that they could perhaps try uh, some of the techniques that we've we've put here. Um, the other thing is that the, the the chemicals that we've selected in here are, are very strongly um, based on the 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 membrane manufacturers as well. Wendell, uh, congratulations on a um, yeah. Toward that end, one of the big challenges we have today is stabilization. Yeah. Yes. Mind. Um, yeah, uh, the question was uh, how would we sustain the database and, um, and keep adding to it and or modifying it as we need we need to and that's something that we haven't really discussed yet. I think it came quite late in the development of the, the pro in the approach about development that it would be a database or some kind of a web-based application so that is something that we we need to discuss and as I mentioned before I think there's a big scope to include a whole range of other chemicals or, or processes that um, like biocides and antiscalins uh, that because there's just hundreds and hundreds of them out there and um, so people might not know that they, they're there or they may um, have a different source so I think it's important to try to get as much of that together but yeah in terms of who would um, host it or who would um, develop it 
continue development, that's something that we, we're discussing. Well, that's a very good question, Wendell. And, and we would certainly aim to make this a living document so that yeah. as new chemicals become available, we can add to that. Um, as new membranes come to market, uh, we'll need to be able to address those as well. So um, hopefully we can take it the next step and, and see that that gets done in the future. Any other questions? Keith. Yeah. The question was, um, could we get users to add in their own information on like uh, cleaning uh, 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 performance changes so they could validate the, the data? And that is certainly something that, that could be that could be included um, in the, the literature review that is um, also part of this. I've looked at a few case studies, but there are there are quite a few other um, sources of that, that kind of information where where people look at real chemicals or different regimes, and they'll uh, they'll report them in the literature. And we could combine those as well into the database somehow, or um, uh, yeah, as a separate document somehow. Any other questions? Okay. Apparently, none of uh, our folks online have any questions. Well, oh, very good. Uh, then you've covered covered the subject very uh, very well. Um, one of the things that I, um, I I think the idea of of adding case studies is is a good one, Keith. Uh, uh, perhaps we can figure out a way that they that the users can actually input. Yes. Is it, a, is it an 8 out of 10 you know, That would be valuable yeah. to, to see just how effective it is. Um, yes. worth, uh, uh, that That's would be worth doing. Certainly, that. yeah. Yeah, most certainly. Sorry, yes? We've got one um, from online. Um, we're wondering if uh, the methodology proposed is supported and tested by the membrane suppliers and what sort of warranty issues um, could be compromised um, it's different from theirs. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, the question was, um, what sort of quality control could, would we have on that, and what what type of um, uh, assurance would we have with the, the membrane suppliers? And I think we have to make it clear to start with that the, we would highly recommend that the people use the membrane manufacturer's guidelines as a first instance. So they may run them for the warranty period with no problems at all. They might get to the end of the warranty period where um, uh, the, they've still got a good membrane, but um, you might want to try some alternative cleanings or that sort of thing. But uh, the, most of the information that, or some of the information in there is is from the manufacturers as well. So I think I might just have to make that clear that it's um, that's uh, according to their directions. All right. Any others? Frank, did you get all of your questions answered? Uh, some of them from, from other questions. Some others, no, but let's say I, I need to develop this question a little bit better, so I may be able to. Sure. Good. I'm sure Marlene would be yeah, happy, more than happy to, answer happy any to address those that yeah, are emailed no to her. Yep. Um, anyway, uh, as you can see, Marlene's put together a huge amount of information. Uh, as I, as far as I know, it's the first time that anyone has taken all of these bits of information on cleaning and chemicals and uh, techniques and put them together into a document then that can be used by anyone. Um, it occurs to me that there are a number of companies in Australia uh, who are familiar with operating membranes of many different manufacturers. And I would s suspect that they would have uh, a lot to share in terms of how they clean particular membranes and on particular applications. So um, I think this will become even more robust as we elicit uh, information from uh, people like uh, that who have, have used these on a, on a continued basis. So uh, I'm hopeful that this uh, will become a a well-used document. We do want it to be well-used. That's its purpose. Um, and if there are any comments um, from any of you present here today or online on how we might make this tool uh, even more effective, uh, please let us know either 
um, directly to, to Marlene or to the center here. Anyway, uh, thank you to Marlene.